Thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. I'd like to thank the funders of Cochrane Canada, without whom these webinars, our training, systematic reviews, and capacity building could not happen. A big thank you as well to CIHR for their support. I'd also like to thank Pahol for kindly providing the software for our webinars. And a special thank you to Louis Gabriel Cuervo, who produces videos of our webinars. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's webinar on systematic reviews of preclinical animal research. Who are the potential knowledge users? Today we'll be hearing from Mark Avey. Dr. Avey completed his PhD at the University of Alberta, where he studied the neural mechanisms of auditory perception in songbirds. He completed a fellowship in animal science policy at the Canadian Council on Animal Care before joining the clinical epidemiology program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute as a CIHR postdoctoral fellow. Mark, please go ahead. Uh, all right, hello everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, uh, as you just said, in Ottawa. And this is actually my first webinar, so I'm going to try and remember to speak slowly um, and, and move through the material. And at the end, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to elaborate uh, on anything that I, I can help you out with. Um, so just to start, um, I just have to figure out how to switch slides. There you go. Systematic reviews of preclinical animal research. Who are the potential knowledge users? So as a as a KT fellow, one of the important things that um, I work on uh, is thinking about how it is that we uh, in take what we learn uh, from our research and we um, move that into practice. Uh, and, and this is, and since I work in a clinical epidemiology program, that's often um, the background is thinking about how do we take clinical trial information or information uh, that we gleaned with working with humans and how do we take that into the clinic uh, with the primary care physicians? How do we move that knowledge from um, the research world into the practice at the hospitals? Now, in preclinical, um, we're actually moving a step backwards with the research um, to um, a step before we work with humans, uh, except that now we've got to think, rethink maybe who are the actual knowledge users, who are the people who are going to use this information, and how do we um, get that, that, that information to those people. Uh, so today's talk is really sort of trying to rethink um, the, same, uh, the, same, the same idea of who are knowledge users and knowledge translation, but moving a step back into the preclinical and looking at the, the, the how to move forward um, into uh, early phase clinical. Uh, so, uh, one way to sort of think about this is to look at, uh, at Cochrane uh, and systematic reviews they produce and, and sort of ask uh, who uses your knowledge. And this is, uh, this is just a screenshot taken uh, a few days ago uh, of the top 50 reviews. This is just showing the top 10 reviews uh, from the past three months that have been accessed uh, from the Cochrane Library. Uh, and you can see that I've highlighted uh, in red here with the red box around it, uh, this one review, uh, Cranberries for Preventing Urinary Tract Infections. Uh, so my question is, um, who do you think is interested in cranberries and UTIs the most? Uh, policymakers, decision makers, researchers, researchers from different disciplines, uh, the public, uh, industry, clinicians, or the media? Okay, there's a lot. There's a lot of non-guesses and uh, non. No. Few people uh, who use the poll uh, said E, and, and this is this is probably right. It's actually really difficult to get this sort of information. Um, uh, who's actually accessing or using when you look online? But the the common sense uh, sort of tells us that the most likely end user for this, who's accessing the, the abstract for this review, is actually uh, the general public. Uh, it's not another not not researchers, uh, not policymakers. Aren't, aren't the number one uh, people accessing this? Uh, so this makes us really sort of highlight that you can produce a systematic review, but the people who are actually going to use that systematic review might not be your fellow colleagues um, who are doing research and systematic review. So it, it highlights the importance of thinking about who are, who are the actual users. So today I'm going to um, cover very briefly and at a very sort of mile high level or 10 mile high level um, 
for knowledge users, what is it that should be being transferred? Uh, and to whom should the knowledge be transferred? So who, who are the potential knowledge users uh, for preclinical? Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the knowledge management system and, and really going to talk about knowledge translation uh, and trying to, try to rethink where do preclinical system act reviews fit from the bench to bedside um, uh, sort of uh, models that we look at for, for knowledge translation. So to start, um, Grimshaw and colleagues have had a paper come out in 2012 where they covered the knowledge translation of, of research findings. And they asked five questions, and I'm gonna, the first two questions that I'm going to look at are, are um, really just the first two questions out of these five. And, and that's, as I said, what should be transferred and to whom should research knowledge be transferred. Um, I'm not going to cover uh, the other questions, by whom should the research knowledge be transferred, uh, and importantly, how should the research knowledge be transferred, uh, and with what effect should research knowledge be transferred. But all these questions are important to think about when we think about knowledge users. Um, we, we need to think about all of these questions uh, even though I'm not going to cover them all today. So what should be transferred? Uh, Grimshaw and colleagues suggest that the basic unit of knowledge translation should usually be up-to-date systematic reviews or other syntheses of research findings. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to um, agree with that, that uh, the, the basic unit of knowledge should be um, systematic reviews. Um, certainly, or potentially other syntheses of research findings. It, it shouldn't be the primary studies uh, that we should be aiming to transfer uh, as, as, a, as a general rule. So when you think about um, systematic reviews and where they fit, you often see, especially if you saw the first uh, webinar in this series by Dr. Leonars, um, you'll, see, you'll see pyramids set up uh, of sort of knowledge pyramids and often systematic reviews are placed at the top of the pyramid um, and then maybe randomized control trials are a step down and you move down to different primary studies um, down to expert opinion usually at the bottom. But when we move and we start thinking about uh, knowledge translation, um, systematic reviews aren't necessarily at the top of the pyramid. Um, and in this case, in uh, this one that, that I'm, I'm going to go through, the, uh, the 6S model, they're, they're somewhere in the middle. Um, and so if we start at the bottom, there's your primary studies at the bottom. These are the original articles, um, maybe RCTs, they may be cohort studies, whatever they are. Uh, and then there's um, synopses of studies. Uh, these would be examples of uh, evidence-based abstract journals. And then there's systematic reviews, um, and obviously uh, the Crofton Library is an excellent example of that uh, in the middle. But as you move um, from systematic reviews um, into practice, and certainly in the clinical field, um, primary care physicians aren't necessarily accessing systematic reviews. Um, they may be accessing uh, synopses of syntheses, uh, for, for, for instance, healthevidence.ca, or they may be accessing um, summaries. So for instance, you would be hoping that a clinical practice guideline will reference systematic reviews, but the uh, practitioners won't be actually um, going and getting the systematic reviews. What they'll be looking at is the clinical practice guideline. So the actual information that's being translated um, is being translated in the clinical practice guideline, but it's based off of the basic unit of knowledge is that we want that based off of systematic reviews, not individual studies. So thinking about how preclinical evidence sort of fits into this model, it's good to go back and think about um, evidence-based medicine uh, and where it fits in. And it, it's the Sven diagram is a nice simplification. Uh, and I think preclinical evidence sort of maybe intuitively fits into the best external evidence, uh, as you can see on the right there. Um, it, it's, it's not part of individual clinical expertise or the patient choices, uh, values, or expectations. Uh, preclinical evidence is, is part of the external evidence base uh, that, we, that we're thinking about for clinical. Um, and you can look at, the, at uh, for instance, staff and colleagues when they describe what evidence-based medicine is. Uh, it's the best available uh, external evidence uh, clinical evidence, and then we mean clinically relevant research often from the basic science and medicine. Um, I, I'm just putting this in here to show that you really need to remember that it's not simply the um, clinical aspect that is the external evidence. It is also the preclinical and the basic sciences of medicine um, are also very important when we think about evidence-based medicine and how we move forward. So uh, this, is, uh, one of the, this is another type of pyramid of thinking about how evidence works and not. I think Dr. Lingars uh, showed one similar to this. Um, this is where systematic reviews are often placed at the top. Uh, and the reason for this is because if you look uh, carefully at this particular diagram, 
Uh, you'll see the top three levels of the pyramid are filtered information. So these are summaries of primary studies, whereas the um, bottom three uh, minus the, the green at the bottom there, they're the unfiltered primary studies. So these are the individual studies which haven't been synthesized together. Uh, and at the very bottom, of course, we have background information or expert opinion. So when we start thinking about preclinical, um, we start having to ask questions about where do systematic reviews of in vivo animal studies, where do they fit in with this um, sort of traditional um, evidence-based preclinical uh, medicine pyramid, uh, and where do individual a animal studies fall in? Do they simply fall in with the randomized control trials or cohort studies somewhere in there, um, or do they fall outside of that because they're not being used with humans? Uh, I think Dr. Leonard's in the first webinar showed um, them below expert opinion is where animal studies were. Um, but you need to think about um, that, that they may not simply fit within the same pyramid. They might actually fall, for instance, without that pyramid uh, or within another pyramid uh, separate from human, the human uh, research uh, modus operandi. So just an example of a different way to think about this. Um, if we look at Yannicka Horn's uh, systematic review, uh, in 2000, she did a Cochrane systematic review of calcium antagonists for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, and so here you have at the top of the pyramid a Cochrane systematic review done in humans. Um, but they also in 2001 did a systematic review of the animal models uh, for this calcium antagonist. Uh, so they're, they're completely separate. The um, um, accumulation, synthesis, and summary of the knowledge um, they, they aren't actually within the same pyramid, uh, but they're actually used when we move forward from this, they're actually used in ways um, which may, where this makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the challenge that uh, Yannick and Horner and colleagues found is when looking at the systematic review of the preclinical was that initially what was happening was that uh, clinical trials were referring in the introduction to a single positive animal experiment to the proven effectiveness. They weren't using a systematic review, so it's um, of the preclinical animal models. So the problem um, isn't so much about how, uh, how can we fit um, preclinical systematic reviews within the knowledge pyramid of the human um, research. Uh, the systematic review or the preclinical can completely be separate and still be a very effective tool um, for, uh, for informing whether or not research should move forward. In fact, uh, in the recent Lancet series on waste, uh, this particular research was referenced uh, by Ian Chalmers and colleagues, and they said that patients are enrolled into clinical trials that do not need to be done. Uh, the more than 7,000 individuals who had had a stroke would not have been enrolled in the clinical trials uh, for the calcium antagonist because systematic reviews of the effects of the drugs and animal studies of stroke do not identify the protective effects. Uh, so here we, see, we clearly see that the systematic review itself of the preclinical has value in and of, of itself, and it's an important value that maybe shouldn't be simply placed at the bottom below um, expert opinion um, uh, in the traditional knowledge pyramid. In fact, it has a really important value too, even when we think about it, not just from the, the perspective of translating into the early uh, clinical trials of humans, but also to inform back to the community researchers uh, who are doing the animal research. Um, this is a, I love this quote. This is an excellent article um, from O'Collins and colleagues. Uh, and the quote is, a common perception of neuroprotection research is that everything works in animals, but nothing works in people. Uh, you don't have to be a bench scientist uh, and it's uh, long to have uh, heard similar quotes along this in a number of areas. Um, and I think what the preclinical systematic review has been showing um, is that there's actually sometimes a common perception that things are working in the animals when in fact they're not. Uh, and that's what the systematic reviews show and they have that value in and to themselves, not just for the translation, but also uh, to inform the, the animal researchers in the preclinical world. So what, what should be transferred? Um, the, the brief argument I'm making, I think other people have made this argument um, elsewhere better, uh, is that the basic unit um, for translation should be a, uh, usually up-to-date systematic reviews or syntheses um, of the preclinical research animal uh, findings. Uh, this, is, this lines up exactly with what goes on in the clinical world, is that the basic unit of knowledge um, arguably is the systematic review. Um, and I think we should be moving towards the same idea. Um, now, uh, oh, it's a little cut off on my screen, uh, but that's okay. Uh, the, the question then is, is to whom should this um, knowledge be transferred? If the systematic review is the basic unit of translation, who, who are the knowledge users? Who does it get translated to? 
Um, so this is again from Grimshaw and colleagues uh, from their work. Uh, and you look at the different stakeholders for different types of research. Uh, so across the top here we have the potential stakeholders uh, and the basics of sciences, clinical, health services, and population health are the research. And then down the uh, column we have the different stakeholders. You have consumers, professionals, local administrators, national policymakers, regulatory bodies, industry, research funders, um, and of course researchers themselves. And you can see that with basic science, um, consumers, uh, professionals, local administrators, and national policymakers are generally considered to be uh, less interested or not interested um, in, in the basic science uh, findings themselves. Um, whereas regulatory bodies, industry, um, research funders, and certainly researchers have a very strong interest in, in looking at this research. It's of a high relevance um, to what they do. So I just want to go through a few examples to, um, to maybe make this a little more concrete. Uh, so when we think of a, a regulator, you might think of Health Canada or the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, you can also think of regulators as oversight. Uh, this would be research ethics boards. Uh, so at least in Canada, um, research ethics boards and the animal care committees, which are, are also known maybe as um, IACUCs down in the U.S., um, they don't necessarily have regulatory authority, so they're more of a these more policy mechanisms, so they're more of an oversight agency. Uh, but these would be examples of the regulators. Uh, and when you look at what a regulator like Health Canada um, wants from non-clinical studies, in this case non-clinical uh, synonymous really with preclinical uh, studies, is that they'll look at good clinical practice, uh, section uh, 7.3.5, and, and they're looking to actually um, get the results of all relevant non-clinical pharmacology, toxicology, uh, pharmacokinetic, and investigational product metabolism studies should be provided in a summary form. Uh, and and the, this, this section is obviously much longer than the quote I have here, but the regulators are already collecting and synthesizing this information um, from industry or um, academics who are running trials. Um, they, already, they already do this and they already collect and summarize the information uh, from preclinical. It's important to them. Um, now, they aren't necessarily lo looking at systematic reviews, though. Uh, same with research ethics boards in Canada. Uh, the TCPS2, that's the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2. Uh, in the section on clinical trials, research ethics boards have the responsibility to present the proposed research in the context of a systematic review. Uh, this clinical trial should not be conducted unnecessarily on questions that have already been definitively answered. Uh, but uh, REVs also do have the same responsibility in the same section um, and I've highlighted it in bold here, should carefully evaluate previous laboratory, animal, and human research um, with the drug or therapy, um, et cetera. So the research ethics boards, once again, as a regulator or regulatory type body, they are uh, charged with reviewing and seeing that the um, premise of the research um, is well, um, well situated. Uh, in the case of clinical, um, the human research, it's already in there to look at it and look at it using a systematic review. But with animal research, um, it's unclear as to what constitutes um, an adequate review, perhaps the investigators for sure, um, but it's not, it's currently not a systematic review is, is utilized as the basic unit of translation for a research ethics board. Uh, so obviously, uh, the industry, this could be pharmaceuticals and bio, biotech companies, funders, I mean, I think of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., et cetera. And researchers might, uh, in the examples I'm giving, uh, which are very focused in the clinical world, uh, might be preclinical or, or clinical researchers, maybe uh, on either side, um, or they may uh, actually uh, work in both areas. Uh, so I'm just going to give, uh, for the sake of time, uh, just skip some of the industry and go right into the funders. Uh, if you look at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, um, Canadian Institutes of Health Institutes of Health Research already require a systematic review of the clinical. Um, they want you to give a reference to any relevant systematic reviews and discuss the need for your trial in light of these reviews. Uh, and if you believe that there is no relevant previous trials, you need to demonstrate your search strategy. So once again, the funder here already values systematic reviews for the clinical area, but clinical uh, systematic reviews, um, not necessarily preclinical systematic reviews. Uh, and here's an example. This is from an editorial um, from Collins and Tabak uh, here, which was recently in Nature, and they just discussed one of the initiatives going on at the NIH 
uh, that they're working on to improve reproducibility, which I'll talk about a little bit later again. Uh, and that's to assess the value of assigning at least one reviewer of each panel to specific tasks of evaluating the scientific pre premise um, of the grant application. The key, and they want you to look at the key publications on which the application is based. Uh, and it's, this is specifically and particularly important when a potentially costly human clinical trial is proposed based on animal model results. So this sounds very good, um, but it, once again, it's um, they're not talking about a systematic review here. In fact, what this sounds like they're talking about is, is a narrative review or an expert opinion um, as opposed to a, a more methodological approach um, like I'm definitely uh, promoting in, in this talk. Uh, and you can think about uh, the last case is different researchers from different disciplines. Um, this is from Bath et al., uh, another excellent paper. Um, and when you look at the differences between animal preclinical studies and clinical studies, you can just look uh, in this table. Uh, down the left, you have uh, uh, things like centers, uh, dose responses, and time responses. And then in the, the middle column, the animal preclinical studies. In the final column, the clinical uh, trials, uh, in this case, phase 2B and 3 trials. And you can look at some of the differences between them. Uh, in the, in the first block, you see dose response and timing response. Um, so in time response, it's variable in the preclinical. Most studies assess early administration. Uh, in clinical, it's uncommon. In fact, you can see that there's a lot of differences between these worlds. And this can be why it's important um, when you're thinking about who the knowledge users are when you're doing your systematic review is to make sure that you're thinking about uh, that there might be people in the clinical world who need to read your systematic review. Um, and then in the, in the differences between the, these worlds need to be taken into account. Um, so who should it be uh, transferred to? Uh, obviously, uh, as I said, regulators, industry, funders, and researchers. Um, all of these um, groups already synthesize and or evaluate preclinical information. In fact, it's, it's either part of the regulatory or policy requirement uh, in, in many cases that, that the regulators impose. Uh, as well as that industry and researchers have to um, adhere to. Um, however, systematic reviews themselves as the basic unit of translation, it's a different method of synthesis than it is what is currently um, sort of the, the standard, um, whether it's the de facto standard or the standard in, in the actual policy documents. Uh, another thing that, that's important to think about uh, is that the systematic reviews may not be the end product. Uh, that's the correct um, product to give to these knowledge users. Uh, in the case of, I think, of a research ethics board, um, is, is the correct product to give it to a research ethics board the actual systematic review versus um, maybe a summary or some other form um, downstream of the systematic review for them to utilize in the decision making process. So uh, two of the big groups that are producing systematic reviews are of course uh, Camarades and Circle. Um, and these, these are, are groups which are definitely focused uh, doing sort of preclinical systematic reviews and, and broadening it out. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about it. If you want to learn more about it, uh, I recommend watching the webinar from Dr. Marlies uh, Leonardo's uh, in the first of the series here. But I did want to say that there are ma there are actually many other groups doing this work uh, in preclinical in different areas. Uh, uh, I think that it's important to, to remember that even though I'm talking about this often in the context of preclinical to clinical, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, the Center for Public Health and Zenosis uh, at the University of Guelph, uh, just a few hours south of here. Um, uh, Dr. Jan Sargent has been really progressive uh, in, in conducting systematic reviews uh, in food safety uh, and zoonoses. Uh, and you can think of a, a, a large uh, a government organization, uh, the European Food Safety Authority, um, has been looking at how to incorporate uh, systematic reviews uh, and, and utilize them in, in food safety over in Europe. And of course, there's the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, uh, which is an international collaboration looking at how to utilize uh, systematic review methodology um, in toxicology. Uh, and, and the National Toxicology Program in the US as well, if you go and look um, at their website, they're also um, looking at it and involved with using system, utilizing systematic reviews. Uh, so there, there's many others. Um, I'm not going to cover all the particular um, knowledge users today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at a very sort of 10 mile high level, but when, if you're in a particular area and you're thinking about doing this, the systematic reviews, you really want to think about within the, this, your scope of practice and within your domain, who are the knowledge users, where is this knowledge going to go, uh, and identify those, those people uh, as early as you can 
uh, in the process. So uh, just to just sort of recap what I've covered so far, uh, what should be transferred, uh, systematic reviews is the basic unit. Um, and it, to whom it should be transferred, um, regulatory bodies, um, industry funders and researchers are obviously the sort of key, uh, key players uh, who are the key knowledge users. Um, but these are not specific examples. It really depends on the particular domain, uh, which uh, any particular uh, researcher would, would know better depending on where you're working on. Um, but the national funders and national regulatories, etc., uh, because they cover such a, a wide swath as well as such important steps in the process um, of, of funding um, and protecting uh, the public in, in the research process, that they're obviously targets that need to be thought about in terms of knowledge use. Uh, so I just want to shift gears a little bit because uh, I did say in the, the bio that I wrote up for this that I talk a little bit about sort of how we should think about preclinical pre system active use fitting into the knowledge man management system. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to try and answer a uh, question at least uh, at least tentatively, where, where do preclinical system active use fit from bench to bedside? Uh, and I'm going to do this in the context um, of NIH's uh, our recent uh, this uh, editorial that Collins and Tabak uh, 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 put out. Uh, uh, Francis S. Collins is the director um, of the NIH and Ron Tabak is the principal deputy. Uh, the NIH uh, spends about $30 billion a year on health research in the U.S. Uh, they're, it's an incredibly uh, important organization uh, and, it's, and it's really uh, an important uh, number of issues that came out uh, in this editorial. Now, the editorials uh, study is being about reproducibility and I'm just going to go a little bit into it uh, just to give a bit of a background about why this is so important. Uh, so first, they're concerned about ir irreproducibility in preclinical uh, and they list a number of problems such as poor training of researchers in experimental design, uh, the provocative statements over technical details and publications, crucial elements of experimental design are simply ignored, uh, secret sauce, uh, that's probably my, my favorite example they list, and it's just um, the idea that uh, researchers are intentionally withholding uh, important methodological aspects of their papers uh, um, uh, so that way they have a competitive advantage. Uh, and then of course uh, a well-known uh, poor reporting of basic experimental designs which is blinding randomization and sample size calculations. Um, uh, so they're taking a number of initiatives and, and these, these ones um, are near and dear to me. Testing the use of checklists to ensure a more systematic evaluation of grant application. Uh, reviewers are reminded to check, for example, that appropriate experimental design features have been addressed, such as an analytical plan, transfer randomization, blinding, and so on. Um, but as I said uh, just earlier, since it's the same quote, um, they're also looking at what is the scientific premise? Um, and, and they're looking at how to assign, uh, in this case, an, an individual or multiple people to look at that. This is really an area where uh, potentially uh, systematic reviews would um, have, have a huge potential for improving um, decisions moving forward uh, and looking at the scientific premise. Now, although all these initiatives um, are sort of geared towards the idea of reproducibility, uh, which is an important aspect, um, the reason that we're concerned about reproducibility uh, really is knowledge translation. Uh, we're really concerned about uh, making sure we can move from preclinical to clinical and, uh, with a certain success rate. We're Reproducibility in it is, is a great goal in itself for us as researchers. That's something that's important uh, for me as a bench scientist. Uh, but as we move forward, we're thinking about the importance of actually taking our discoveries uh, at the preclinical stage and translating them to clinics successfully. Uh, and reproducibility is part of that. So knowledge translation, just for those um, who aren't experts in it, uh, I, I don't consider myself to be an expert in it, although I am a, I am a KT fellow. Um, a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve health, provide more effective health services and products, uh, and strengthen the healthcare system. Uh, this is a definition from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Um, so when we, even when I read this definition of it, I, I often feel that this, this doesn't quite capture what we're doing when we move from preclinical to clinical necessarily. Um, it's definitely, it has a bit of a, a feel that it's, it's focused a little bit more on moving from the clinic to the bedside. Um, but we can think about certainly knowledge translation uh, and the key points of it, and we can think about it and apply it to the preclinical area. Uh, so uh, these sort of standard points are uh, making users aware of knowledge, 
Um, are clinical trialists aware of preclinical systematic reviews? This is a really basic question. Um, I know on uh, the clinical epidemiology program here um, at the Auto Hospital Research Institute, I, I work with uh, clinicians uh, as well as preclinical scientists, uh, and just just making people aware that uh, using systematic reviews for the preclinical information uh, is, an, is a tool that's available. Um, it is, is something that's important to do because not not everyone and probably not the majority of people conducting clinical trials are aware uh, that this is an option. Uh, facilitating the use of the knowledge. So how should systematic reviews be presented? Um, as I said, to, for instance, a research ethics board. Uh, if you discuss um, uh, with research ethics board's members, they might really like the idea, for instance, of having a systematic review being part of, of the review process. Uh, but research ethics board's members are incredibly swamped uh, with uh, a huge workload of reviewing protocols and whether or not they even have the expertise um, to, to read this uh, a systematic review and interpret it uh, in the context uh, are part question. So a systematic review itself um, may not be the right tool to translate the knowledge. There may need to be um, some, some uh, summary or some other, other uh, downstream product. Same with uh, moving knowledge into action. Action. One of the key things is to simply get out there and start conducting the preclinical uh, systematic reviews, uh, and that's that's some, some same idea for closing the gap between what we know and what we do, uh, as well. Uh, and an important thing to rem remember too about uh, when we're moving from preclinical uh, to clinical is integrated uh, knowledge translation, and this is where knowledge users and researchers. Uh, work together, uh, shape research questions, uh, interpret study findings, and move research, research results into practice. Uh, and th this makes a lot of sense, uh, especially the last point. When we think about how are we moving research results into practice. And the example I gave at the very start with Anna Conform's work, um, the preclinical systematic review was unfortunately done after the clinical systematic review. Um, and it was done long after many of the clinical trials had actually been conducted. Um, we, we need to be doing the, the preclinical systematic reviews before we do the clinical systematic review and before we do the clinical trials. Um, so we really need to be moving this um, up, in, up in time and we need to work uh, with the uh, clinicians who, uh, who are developing the clinical trials uh, as, what, as well as with the people doing the preclinical systematic reviews to make sure that they're answering the right questions and getting the right um, data out of the preclinical that will, that will best inform the actual clinical trial as we move forward. So when you think about this now uh, in terms of models, uh, knowledge translation, uh, there, there's no shortage of models um, out there to look at. Uh, so this, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of them uh, before I, I try to, to sort of wedge uh, what I think is, is a good spot for the systematic reviews to fit in. Uh, this one is from recent colleagues uh, in 2008, actually. Uh, and, and these are the valleys of death. Um, uh, I hope someone's smiling uh, at that, that title. Uh, but as we move from basic biomedical research, we go through uh, valley one, the first valley of death, before we get to the clinical science and knowledge. And then, of course, there's another valley of death, uh, the clinical practice and health decision making. Uh, and valley two, valley two is really where a lot of the KT science um, has been focused. Uh, but there's definitely more attention now being focused, I, I, I think, on valley one uh, with the problems with reproducibility. Um, and, and on all the issues that are coming up from doing systematic reviews and evaluating the reporting quality um, in the preclinical. Uh, and and this, is, this is the value that we're interested in. We're interested in value one. Uh, this is uh, the same um, idea. It's a different conceptualization. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but we go all the way from T0 uh, to T4. Um, people may be more familiar with the, using the, the T's to describe the the gaps between uh, the different stages of research. So with uh, T0, we go with scientific discovery research, and that's then translated to T1, uh, translational research from discovery to candidate application. Uh, so we're, we're interested really in sort of the scientific discovery T1 candidate application. That, that's really the area that we're focused on when we're talking about preclinical systematic reviews. Um, and and that, that's that's the area that we need to sort of expand on and look at in more detail. Uh, and a great way to look at that in more detail is this uh, wonderful article by Westfall and colleagues called Practice-Based Research, the Blue Highways on the NIH Roadmap. 
uh, and uh, besides from the red box that I've uh, added just to highlight where we're looking, um, I'll go through the, the roadmap is that it starts at the bench with basic science and we have a preclinical animal studies in the, the box at the, the top left. And then T1 research, this is our phase one and phase two clinical trials and this is, this is translation to humans. Uh, and then this, this moves more to, to bedside with human clinical research with our controlled observational studies and phase three clinical trials. Uh, T2 then translates this into clinical practice, right? And this is where we're delivering the recommended care to the right patient at the right time. Uh, well, not me, I, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but identification of new clinical questions and gaps in care. Uh, and so in this particular article, they were really expanding on what's T2 uh, and talking about doing practice-based research. Uh, and when you look at what they're, they've expanded at the bottom of the graph here, uh, they have T2, uh, which is guidelines, development, meta-analysis, and systematic reviews sort of occurring um, underneath uh, the bedside uh, uh, box with translation to patients. And of course, in, under T2, they have the phase three and, and four clinical trials, uh, observational studies, and survey research. And, and T3 is really the dissemination research and implementation research that translates those findings into practice. Now, our, our interest is really back here at the top left in the red box. Um, I can here, and, and this is this is what we're, we need to think about when we're translating the research to the knowledge users uh, from systematic reviews, from the basic science research preclinical into T1. Um, but this is a this is a fairly tight box, and, it, and this is often in these models when you look at this, this is this is the way it's described. Uh, preclinical is, is simply uh, one box, and, and then it goes right to phase one. So I, I want to expand the preclinical, and, and there's Fortunately, very recently, uh, Jonathan Kimmelman and his colleagues published a, a great paper uh, which allows us to sort of um, think about uh, the basic science and, and, and expand it out. And, and the, the basic premise that they talked about was the difference between exploratory and confirmatory research uh, at the basic science level. So exploratory research was essentially developing the pathological theories or mechanisms of the drug's actions, and you could compare this with confirmatory research where we're rigorously testing the drug's clinical potential and restricting the advance of ineffective interventions being advanced into clinical testing. So in the preclinical area, um, we definitely have lots of exploratory research. I definitely did um, myself as a bench scientist more, I did more exploratory uh, research, uh, whereas confirmatory research looks much more similar uh, to what you would find in a clinical trial. Um, and, and it's it's really the translational research uh, that we use to move from preclinical to clinical research. So that, that already lets us expand that box of basic science and, and start to tease it apart and understand where systematic reviews are going to fit in. Um, now, another sort of caveat to, to remember uh, when, when I'm talking about moving over is, is there's this perceived need when you start talking about uh, knowledge translation uh, is that everything um, uh, needs to be translated uh, and we need to spend money translating every finding that we got in every researcher and every lab needs to have a, a knowledge translation strategy. Uh, and I, and I just want to back off before I go any further and, and just say that that's not what I'm promoting. I don't think that's what uh, CAHR and, and many of these people in the knowledge translation world are promoting. Um, in fact, it, it, it goes against what they're saying. Um, this, this, this point here is, quote, uh, results from a single research study should be contextualized within the synthesis of global, global research results before extraordinary dissemination and implementation efforts are undertaken. And this, this ties back into what I said, that really systematic reviews are the basic unit of knowledge translation. We're not talking about um, finding one study where endostatins uh, look like they're good for curing cancer in rats and then immediately running um, with a massive knowledge translation strategy uh, to implement that in, in a clinical trials. Um, we need multiple studies that confirm it, with multi understand the pathophysiology, et cetera, and, and synthesize that information um, before, before we go forward. So what might this look like? This is uh, my, uh, my attempt that I've been uh, working on uh, some people to try and break apart the, the preclinical translation and, and understand where systematic reviews are going to fit in uh, to improving the translation. So I'll just walk you through it. Um, uh, at the bench level, we split bench research into, into Jonathan Kimmelman's um, exploratory research here, uh, as well as basic research here. And we have uh, preclinical translation exploratory uh, sort of in between them. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, talk about that. I'm going to focus 
on the PTC here of uh, preclinical translation uh, con confirmatory. And if we expand it along it, the, the similar method, similar way that uh, Westfall and colleagues did with T2 uh, to translate, um, in this case we're translating the T1 to the phase one, uh, is that we look that the translation to humans, I, I think, actually is starting much earlier in, in the knowledge system. Uh, translation to humans uh, doesn't just start over here at T1. Translation to humans is starting at the confirmatory stage here uh, because we need to be thinking about and designing our confirmatory bench studies, thinking about what the clinical trials are going to look like. Uh, and, and this is where guidelines development, meta-analysis, and systematic reviews will help us um, to translate to humans as well as translating to other animal models. So um, systematic reviews, of course, allow us to evaluate multiple models as well as multiple species um, and, and their effectiveness. Uh, so this, this would be uh, uh, sort of the preclinical translation one. Um, now, the, the, the type of translation-based research um, uh, the, the one that's being promoted the most, at least uh, anecdotally, from what, what I've seen, are these ideas of multi-center preclinical or phase three preclinical trials. Um, but as well as uh, doing secondary research within in this translation step, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis um, as an important part of the, the research tool for moving into T1. Uh, and then, similar to um, our dissemination and implementation research, when we're moving research into practice. Uh, so at the moving it from um, bedside research uh, in, in late phase clinical trials but to actually practice with doctors, we do need to have to do dissemination and implementation research um, for moving research um, from the bench at this confirmatory stage into the clinical trials. We, we, we can't ignore this, this topic area and just assume that it's going to happen uh, without putting some effort and resources into understanding the processes and how these things actually work. Uh, so finally, uh, just, to, just to review, uh, preclinical translation at the confirmatory stage, you can think of, the, of this as guidelines, for instance, the STAIR recommendations for stroke, uh, and of course, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, efficacy and safety uh, reviews, and maybe even etiology reviews uh, in some cases, uh, just as a few examples. Uh, and at the dissemination stage, um, right, we, we, these are the questions that I've really been trying to Trying to, trying to touch upon it earlier in the talk is do the systematic reviews reach the right knowledge users? Um, are the traditional publications uh, versus other formats the right, uh, the right tools for, for disseminating the information? Uh, and implementation, um, how is preclinical animal research actually being utilized by the decision make makers at regulators and research ethics boards? Um, uh, we don't necessarily have actually uh, very good information on this and, and how is efficacy and safety weighted in the decision making process. That might impact how we're actually looking at uh, uh, conducting uh, and analyzing the information systematic reviews and certainly how we're presenting it uh, to these groups. Um, so where do preclinical systematic reviews fit from bench to bedside? Uh, they're definitely part of T1 but they're, they're within the bench side. They start at the confirmatory stage uh, I think certainly. Um, uh, maybe they even started the exploratory stage. I, I didn't touch upon that uh, today. Um, certainly uh, lots of people have opinions on, on that matter. Uh, but the definitely uh, for, for moving the information from preclinical uh, to T1, uh, I think it, it's fair to say that systematic reviews definitely play a role in the confirmatory uh, sphere. Uh, so to sum up, uh, the basic unit of, of preclinical translation uh, really should be systematic reviews, um, maybe other forms of, of synthesis as well. Uh, and then the, the key knowledge users are really going to be regulators, um, industry funders, uh, and, and other researchers um, who, who, are, who need the information to, to do the translation. Um, we need to, to integrate um, all of these users into the research uh, and research questions in meaningful ways. Uh, and we need to promote the adoption of systematic reviews as a tool. Um, it, it's really important for practicing evidence-based medicine to continually uh, promote the adoption of the best tools. Uh, and, and it's something that uh, preclinical systematic reviewers uh, we need to continue doing as well. Uh, and it's for, for knowledge translation and, and sort of where does it fit in the knowledge management system, as I just uh, argued, preclinical systematic reviews um, are really at the T1 and at the bench. Um, because at the T1 stage, uh, if you're um, a research ethics board, a human research ethics board, looking at whether or not a trial goes forward, you need to look um, at the preclinical basis of it and you need to look at it with, with the same uh, seriousness that you do um, at the human clinical 
Um, and at the bench stage, if you're an animal care committee, you you also need to be looking at the preclinical work uh, that's being presented to you, for instance, uh, with, a, with the same sort of seriousness um, that, that you would, um, I think, the clinical work that, that, that the way an REB would. Um, so it's really a sort of an expansion of the bench portion uh, of knowledge translation. Uh, and by, by expanding that and looking at it in more detail, uh, I think it helps us see where uh, systematic reviews fit in the knowledge translation process. Uh, and so that's everything. Um, we're simply undone. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the Alder Hospital Research Institute uh, and the Canadian Institute of Health Research for supporting me uh, and my advisors, uh, Dr. David Moore and uh, Jenny Griffin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic. If everyone, if we can just send Mark another round of applause by clicking on the emoticon, that would be fantastic. Now, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them, to type them into the chat room. I have um, gone ahead and sent you over the evaluation link. If you can just take a moment and please fill that evaluation out, that would be fantastic. It does help us um, reassure, uh, reassure that you know we are meeting any of the evaluations and let us know how we are doing. So while we wait uh, to see if any questions come through, I'd also like to um, let you know about our uh, impact stories. We want to hear about you um, and how you use Cochrane evidence to make your healthcare decisions. Submit your Cochrane story for a chance to win an iPad or an Amazon gift card uh, worth $500 or $250. And every submission also does get a $5 Starbucks coupon. Please visit our site for more details on that. Mark, we do have one question here for you. Is there one place stop to find systematic reviews of animal studies, such as the Cochrane Library? What do you recommend? Hi. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the question. It's actually a very good question. Uh, let, me, let me give a few uh, points on that. Uh, there is um, there's no one-stop place uh, currently. Um, there's definitely a new journal that's recently come out, and take this with a grain of salt, you some of the editorial board, uh, evidence-based preclinical uh, medicine uh, started by uh, uh, Dr. David Howells and Dr. Malcolm McLeod, uh, which will be accepting uh, preclinical uh, systematic reviews from uh, a variety of areas, uh, environmental toxicology, toxicology, um, you, you name it, uh, obviously uh, preclinical drug, biologics, etc. cetera. Uh, so that will hopefully become a very good source for finding them, but it's not a one-stop uh, source for finding them. One thing that we're working on uh, certainly, uh, myself at the Auto Hospital Research Institute with uh, my colleagues uh, at Circle and uh, Camarades, uh, I was looking at uh, how we can uh, sort of emulate uh, uh, Prospero. Uh, Prospero is a uh, uh, systematic review registry where you can go in, you spend about an hour, and you pre-register your, your clinical systematic review before you conduct it, which makes it a very useful spot to go and stop um, and actually search to see whether or not there's a systematic review being proposed or being done uh, as sort of a one-stop place uh, to, to, to find them. And so one thing that we're definitely working on uh, is actually getting up and running uh, a similar registry where people have the option to come and pre-register um, uh, uh, preclinical studies. Uh, Prospero is currently limited to human use. Uh, it, it is. Uh, to clinical studies, and what we're 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 looking at, uh, we're, we're in discussion with them currently uh, to see about expanding that mandate uh, to preclinical, uh, because uh, it's it, there there are going to be there will be definitely need to be changes uh, uh, that would have to occur uh, for what is registered. Excellent, thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank you for coming out to today's webinar. And I'd like to send another big thank you to Mark, our presenter for today, on a very successful webinar. Now, please visit our site for some updates on upcoming training um, and events that will be happening with Cochrane soon. Thank you, and I wish you all a great day.